and the advisor for the Black Law Students Association. My job this evening, I have the honor of moderating this next 90 minutes as we talk through some of the issues that came about as a result of the death of Breonna Taylor and the lack of indictment, we'll say, with regard to the grand jury investigation. Um, we have four amazing panelists that are going to be talking about different issues with regard to criminal law or constitutional law, but to make sure that everyone's on the same page in terms of what the sort of basic facts are, the uncontested facts are, I'm gonna start off the evening before I turn it over to Dean Taylor to introduce the panelists by reading the first paragraph of the grand jury orders that resulted, um, that were, are related to the Breonna Taylor indictment, or excuse me, the indictment of the people charged in her death. So opinion and order. On March 13th, 2020, officers of the Louisville Metro Police Department executed a search wa wa warrant, excuse me, at 3003 Springfield Drive in Louisville, Kentucky. During the execution of that warrant, Breonna Taylor was shot and killed. An officer received a gunshot wound to the leg and neighboring apartments sustained property damage. Due to a conflict with the Jefferson County Commonwealth's attorney, the office of Daniel Cameron, the attorney general of Kentucky took over the investigation and grand jury proceedings regarding the execution of the search warrant. So those are the basic facts as presented in the order. Obviously, there have been more facts reported throughout the night, which I'm sure some of our panelists will, talk, will touch on. But to the extent that we can all sort of start from the same page, I wanted to make that clear. Um, and now it is my honor to introduce Dean jo John Taylor, who is a, currently our interim dean and longtime professor here at the College of Law. Dean Taylor. Hey, good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out to this. I really appreciate. Um, I really appreciate all the panelists agreeing to be here tonight. Um, so I'm going to introduce folks in the order in which they will be uh, speaking. So first, we have our own um, Amy Seifert. Um, Amy is a lecturer in law here at the college. She also directs the Aspire program um, on the downtown campus. She grew up in Morgantown. She graduated from Carnegie Mellon in 2001, where she was a, a, a Truman Scholar. Uh, she also graduated uh, with honors from Harvard Law School in 2005, clerked in the Southern District of New York, and then worked for a while uh, in litigation at the very prestigious firm of Wilmer Hale in New York. Um, she teaches criminal law for us, has also taught uh, professional responsibility, appellate advocacy, and perhaps other things as well. Um, she writes about education law um, and about algorithmic decision making in the criminal justice system and in the schools. Um, so Amy, thank you very much for being here. Um, I'm extremely pleased to say that we have a couple of folks coming in from other schools to join us. Uh, we have Dr. Bridget Baldwin, uh, who has experience working as a staff attorney for uh, the Criminal Defense Division of the Legal Aid Society of New York. Uh, she became a staff attorney from the Bronx Defenders later and then also worked for a while in a law firm, so she has very extensive criminal law experience. Um, she became a visiting assistant professor in criminal justice at Northeastern, um, earned a PhD there um, in the uh, Law Policy and Society program. Um, and she writes about criminal law and procedure, international criminal justice, evidence, critical race theory, and welfare law. So Dr. Baldwin, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, uh, we have another visitor uh, who, again, we appreciate joining us. We have Professor Don Corbett um, from North Carolina Central University, uh, back from my neck of the woods. I lived in Durham for a while and am a native North Carolinian. So Dr. Cor I mean, Professor Corbett, we welcome you. Um, Professor Corbett uh, has uh, bachelor's and master's degrees from North Carolina A&T State University, um, and he received his law degree from uh, the University of North Carolina School of Law, uh, which is widely recognized as the best law school in the world because it is where I went, um, other than this one. Um, and Professor Corbett's primary teaching areas are constitutional law and torts. And then finally, so Professor Corbett, thank you very much for being with us. And then finally, we have our own uh, Professor Robert Bastris. Uh, professor Bastris is the John W. Fisher II Professor of Law here at West Virginia University. Um, 
His vast expertise includes, among other areas, United States constitutional law, employment discrimination, um, and um, uh, most definitely the West Virginia constitutional law on which he is within a doubt the world's foremost expert. And he is with us tonight um, to share his uh, great knowledge of civil rights law and section 1983 law specifically. So we have a terrific panel and uh, that's all you'll hear from me. So Amy, I believe you are first up. Before Professor Cipher goes, I just wanted to make one sort of administrative note, which is tonight, if I have not said so before, the, the panel is being sponsored by the Black Law Students Association, who kindly invited me to moderate, and the National Lawyers Guild Association, the, the West Virginia chapter. So I, I didn't want to uh, let the evening go any further without making that acknowledgement. So thank you both for, thank you to both groups for their assistance in putting this together. Professor Seifert, all yours. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dean Taylor, for that introduction. And thank you so much, Professor Martin, for moderating. Thank you so much to my co-panelists. I am really looking forward to hearing your presentations this evening. And most especially, thank you to the students who have worked so hard to have this evening come to fruition. I'm especially grateful to Natalia Watkins, who has really done a ton of work to get this panel uh, together. So let me share my screen here. Um, as Professor Martin said, I am uh, speaking a lot this evening about criminal law, and I'm speaking specifically about the grand jury process, both in general, um, in historical terms, but also in the state of Kentucky, and how exactly this worked here in this case. Uh, okay, so one of the most important things to know about the grand jury process, I'm sorry, I'd skipped one, is that the idea of a grand jury is really deeply rooted in our legal system. It traces back, obviously, to the English legal tradition, and it's enshrined in the Fifth Amendment. The Supreme Court has said that a grand jury exists for two purposes, to determine probable cause um, about whether or not a crime has been committed, but also, and this one will be important going forward for some of the conversations we're going to have, to protect citizens uh, against unfounded criminal prosecutions. The grand jury process is usually very shrouded in secrecy. Uh, normally, the traditional justifications given for this secrecy are for reasons such as protecting the reputation of people who are accused but not ultimately indicted, to prevent the flight of offenders because sometimes you have someone who doesn't even realize that there is a grand jury considering them and they don't want to have flight risks there, to shield witnesses, um, to protect the grand jurors themselves. That will become important again later as we talk about some of the, the work that anonymous grand jurors are now having to do in this instance. And finally, to, protect, to prevent undue prejudice against the public jury pool should an indictment um, go forward and should there be then a trial that involved a regular jury. It's pretty rare for, for grand jury proceedings to be released, but it, there is, of course, historical context for it. It did happen, for example, when the grand jury declined to indict Darren Wilson, who was the police officer, of course, who killed Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. So as with so many things in criminal law for the grand jury process, there is the theory and then there is the practice. So in theory, grand juries have really wide latitude. I have a quote there from a Supreme Court case, U.S. v. Calandra. And in general, or excuse me, in theory, grand juries can hear from lots of witnesses. They can compel testimony. They can consider a variety of different kinds of charges. Um, in practice, however, in practice, I think that it's very fair to say that the prosecutor who is bringing the, the charges forward has really enormous power in the grand jury process. Grand juries, as all juries, are generally lay people. They don't have necessarily specialized legal knowledge. 
it's not always clear to them exactly what their powers are or exactly what they could be doing. And so I know that Professor Corbett is going to touch more on prosecutorial discretion in his presentation and especially how prosecutorial discretion can often play out um, in, in racialized terms. But I think it's really important to note that prosecutorial discretion is especially a big issue in grand jury proceedings. There's not a judge you know, who's, who's there sort of overseeing things. Almost always vote working in New York, of course, the, the famous a ham sandwich. Um, I don't think that it's it's quite that stark, but for example, um, the federal uh, justice statistics from 2010 tell us that a people ended up not being indicted by. And of course, they, um, they are not presented to the grand juries to Professor Cypher, um, sorry to cut you off, but you're coming up. Indicting on charges that are not necessary. Um, is, am I, let's see. I can try to switch to my internet here and see if we can do a little better. I, let me try this. Yeah, apologize for cutting better. you off, but it was it was good, getting kind of bad there. Apologize, apologies. That so is is this any better? Can we hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Hopefully that will will help. So the grand jury process in Kentucky, um, there are twelve members. Nine of them have to agree in order to return an indictment. It can be an investigation can be initiated as in most grand juries by the prosecuting attorney bringing forward the charge or grand jurors can actually initiate investigations on their own based on other offenses which come to their attention. And I have the citations here from the Kentucky Rules of Criminal Procedure. They are prohibited as most grand jurors are from discussing the proceedings and the testimony, although courts can order uh, that that is, is lifted and that prohibition has been lifted here by a court order. All testimony is recorded, but none of the deliberations are supposed to have a transcript. Um, and finally, it's important to remember that uh, double jeopardy doesn't attach at the grand jury stage. So there's a Kentucky rule of criminal procedure on point that says that the failure to return an indictment does not prevent any charge against such a defendant from being submitted to another grand jury. The timeline of the grand jury proceeding here on May 13th, the Louisville prosecutor recused himself and the Kentucky Attorney General, Daniel Cameron, was named as the special prosecutor. And over the course of several days in September, it was presented to a grand jury that had been impaneled for the entire month. And on September 23rd, that grand jury announced indictments, uh, an indictment against former officer Brett Hankinson on three counts of wanton endangerment. Um, th that was based on shots fired into a neighboring apartment. There were no charges against any other officers or against anyone for Brianna Taylor's death. On September 28th, in part in response to some statements that Attorney General Cameron had made, an anonymous juror issued a statement that challenged some of the public statements that he had made. And in fact, that anonymous grand juror said that Cameron was using the grand jurors here, I'm quoting, as a shield to deflect accountability and responsibility for decisions. And that uh, Attorney General Cameron's actions had led more seeds of doubt in the process. So then on October 2nd, in response to a court order in former officer Hankinson's case, the attorney general released 15 hours of audio recordings from those grand jury proceedings. And on October 20th, so just recently here, Judge Annie O'Connell of the Jefferson County Circuit Court granted a request made by anonymous juror one to speak freely. Um, in her ruling, she began by noting that the trial judge in Hankinson's case had already ordered that the transcript be released 
but that there was additional information that she was ordering released. She went through each of the traditional arguments in favor of grand jury secrecy that we, we uh, saw on the former slide and she explained why they didn't apply here. First, she noted that Hankinson had already been charged so there was no flight risk. Um, there wasn't concern she found that additional witnesses wouldn't come forward. Um, the identity of other law enforcement officers was already known to the public so there was nothing that would be harmful there. Attorney General Cameron argued in opposition that it would uh, the, the, this release and allowing the jurors to speak would unfairly harm former officer Hankinson's case, but former officer Hankinson didn't join that argument and Judge O'Connell found that A.G. Cameron had not actually provided any background or context or evidence for that assertion. So in response, uh, Attorney General Cameron said that he disagreed with the ruling, but that he was not going to, to fight it any further. And so anonymous grand juror one would be free to speak if he or she so wished. Um, and they issued a statement uh, that you can see here that among other things said that the grand jury was not presented with any charges other than the wanton endangerment charges. And I should add that Attorney General Cameron has confirmed that, um, that he did not present any charges other than that to the grand jury. His statement, and I'm quoting was, they're an independent body. If they wanted to make an assessment about different charges, they could have done that. Um, but here you'll see that attorney, or excuse me, anonymous juror one is saying, the grand jury didn't have homicide offenses explained to them. They never heard anything about those laws. Self-defense or justification was never explained either. So that was the statement of anonymous juror one. What we know about the charges at this point, um, because when uh, the, the 15 hours of audio was released about the grand jury proceedings. The, the specific charge that the uh, attorney general provided to the grand jury about charges was not included in that audio. So we, we have to surmise a little bit here, but attorney general Cameron has confirmed that he didn't present homicide charges and he's described Kentucky self-defense laws as vigorous and said that is why. I'm quoting here from him, the charge that we could prove at trial beyond reasonable doubt was for wanton endangerment against Mr. Hankinson. Miles Cosgrove and Jonathan Mattingly were fired upon by Mr. Walker. They were justified in returning fire. Um, and of course, my first year criminal law students should, should know the wanton endangerment um, elements that would have to be proven there. There's been a really recent development, which is that last week, late last week, um, anonymous grand juror two also um, came out and is supporting some of what anonymous grand juror one said, among other things saying that no opportunity to consider anything else was permitted to the grand jury. It's not clear exactly what they mean by that, but um, it does appear that the, uh, there are grand jurors who are, are interested in speaking um, and, and, and allowing uh, the public to hear more from them. In terms of what's next, reportedly there is an FBI investigation that could in theory result in civil rights violations charges. I am sure that um, Professors Corbett and Bastris can explain better than I can why those are probably very unlikely and how the burden of proof in those types of cases is very high. So I will stop there and look forward to hearing the rest of the presentations. I'm sorry about the internet issues. Thank you so much, Professor Seifert. That was incredibly informative. I have notes already and my own questions to ask after um, others have gotten through. But before we get there, we are now going to hear from Professor Bridget Baldwin. Professor, you have the floor. Um, so, I apologize if it seems as if I'm zigzagging between the screen because I have like multiple uh, desktops running here in order to make this Zoom work. Um, can I share my screen? Is that possible? You should have that function as a co-host, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm not even sure, can you see? Okay, there you go. Um, so I entitled my talk today, When the Law Fails, and I'm 
primarily going to be discussing no-knock warrants and um, how it relates to Breonna Taylor's case and also a little bit of um, the intersection between the Black Lives Matter movement. So I think it's uh, beneficial first to start off at the beginning um, talking about what we actually need um, to have a valid search warrant. So in this particular case, Detective Joshua James, he presented an affidavit to Circuit Judge Mary uh, Shaw. And, and so the law requires that he present an affidavit and the affidavit has to establish probable cause. And it's up to Judge Shaw to determine whether or not probable cause exists. And so it says he has to present it to a neutral and detached magistrate, meaning she can't have any stake in the outcome. She doesn't care whether she issues it or not. And then she looks at it to determine whether or not probable cause exists. And in determining whether or not probable cause exists, she looks at, okay, so is there a particularity requirement in that? Meaning, did the officer specify, what are you looking for? Where do you think it might be? Do you have an address? Do you have a description? And, um, and that's supported by an oath and affirmation. Sometimes warrants also have to specify um, when they're executed, um, is there a limitation um, on the time of day? Um, will it be executed between a certain um, hours of the day? Um, will it expire after a certain period of time? And um, also all warrants are generally required to be executed by the officer knocking and announcing their presence. So um, the knock and announce requirement mandates, it's the rule, it's not the exception. So it mandates before police officers um, can enter a, enter a private residence that they have to knock and, and give notice of what their authority for being at that location um, and, and what authority they have to search the premises. Um, before they can enter under the knock and announce rule, they have to either be refused entry or um, no answer, and then they can forcibly um, enter the premises. Now, the knock and announce rule serves um, dual purposes, right? It protects, of course, my privacy interests as a homeowner. homeowner. Um, it allows me to actually respond to police officers. It allows me, if, if in this particular case, remember the warrant was executed at 1240, AM, so it allows me to get dressed um, because I might be sleeping. It prevents needless destruction of property. It also keeps me safe. It protects the police officer. That's another part of that. Most often, late at night, we don't know who's coming to our house, a prowler, a burglar entering our house. And so when police officers are entering, our first inclination, if we don't know it's a police officer, is to shoot first. So it serves a dual purpose of protecting our privacy interests and the homeowner's interest. And it also protects uh, police officers' uh, safety. Okay, I'm sorry, I had my screen stuck. Okay, now a no-knock warrant is the exception to the knock and announce rule. And it authorizes police officers to enter with a search warrant um, without having to knock and announce their presence. It doesn't change the validity of everything else that's required um, on the warrant to get the warrant, but it changes the requirement of whether or not they have to knock before they enter. In order to get a no-knock warrant, uh, the officer in the affidavit has to provide reasonable suspicion that one of these three things might be a concern. So they have to allege that, well, we have reason to believe that if we knock and announce, the uh, people inside are going to destroy the evidence that we're looking for in this warrant. Or these people are so dangerous that um, if we knock and announce, it's gonna jeopardize our safety. And then another reason is, well, it's just no, it's no reason to, uh, to knock and announce because if we do, you know, nobody's home, it's abandoned or whatever reason they might use. These have been the three major uh, reasons that have been um, allowed to get the exception. When an officer does 
uh, request a no knock warrant and it's granted, it has to be noted or generally it's noted on the um, warrant itself. So how have the Supreme Court weighed in on this issue? And, and the, the, the major case which said, yes, it is the rule, the not gonna announce uh, rule, uh, not gonna announce requirement is the rule, is Wilson versus Arkansas. And I can go in on days and in, 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 in on this case because it, it actually has a wonderful backstory. Um, if many of you have heard of the movie American Made with Tom Cruise in it, that's about this case. Um, and it was about really the drug conspiracy involving pre former President Bill Clinton and district attorneys. I mean, it's just a wonderful movie to just engulf, not really involving the act actual facts of this case. So in this particular case, um, police officers went, uh, asked for a no-knock warrant, uh, claiming that, you know, these people are dangerous, um, are, we, we need to have a no-knock warrant, they're going to destroy evidence, and so they entered by announcing as they were entering. And so the issue in the case is, well, is the no-knock warrant really necessary? Is it required by the Fourth Amendment? And the Supreme Court said yes. Yes, it is. It is unreasonable to enter someone's home without knocking and announcing your presence before you forcibly enter. So that was a great case. And then we get Hudson versus Michigan. And Hudson versus Michigan, um, that was a case where police officers were claiming that these individuals had a large amount of drugs and they were dangerous. And so they entered the door that was unlocked, but as they're entering, they say police officers and then, and then they're, as they're entering. And so it was a clear violation of the no knock rule. But what this case did was provided us a right or provided a, a special privilege to us, but left us with no remedy, no real remedy. Um, because this case was looking at, should the rule of exclusion, meaning if police officers come into my home and they violate this constitutional principle that's required by the Fourth Amendment, and they enter my home and they seize this evidence, can it be suppressed? And the court said in that case, Unfortunately, the, ex the, the exclusionary rule is not the remedy that we're going to provide for violating the knock and announce rule, that you would just have to seek alternatives through uh, 1983 actions. And then the last case I'll discuss with you is a case from my hometown. I'm actually from Wisconsin. And um, so this was a case where police officers um, wanted to uh, get a no-knock warrant actually to search a hotel that the defendant was was at. And um, and they specifically asked for the no-knock warrant, but it was denied. Police entered anyway without um, knocking. And, and the uh, government wanted to argue, the state wanted to argue that, well, we think um, that there's a special, special situation going on in drug cases. And therefore, it's a, it should be the exception that drug dealers are, they're dangerous. There's a high level of destruction of drugs and uh, of evidence in this case. And therefore, we should get an exception to the knock and announce rule when it came to drug cases. And the court said, no. No, there's that, that although they approved the, um, the way the police entered in this case, they said no knock warrants are the exception, that they are the exception, and that in order to get a no knock um, warrant um, given, you have to provide reasonable suspicion that it, either there's danger to the officer, destruction of evidence, or futility. So, what are the statistics here? what's going on when we get these no-knock warrants relating to injury or death or how many are being issued? I'm sorry, we don't know. There's no common database that includes federal and um, state information. So we don't really have good statistics on no-knock um, searches. I think uh, the New York Times in 2017, they did do a search. Uh, I'm sorry, they did do a study, a four-year study, and, and they concluded um, during that period that I think it was 81 people who died um, when SWAT uh, teams were doing surprise search warrants and 13 law, uh, law enforcement officers died. Um, and that didn't include any information on uh, no-knock warrants, but just surprise search warrants. 
So in this particular case, um, the police officers in the Breonna Taylor case, they did actually request a no knock warrant. Um, and um, even though there is some, I guess, uh, dispute what, um, of whether or not they actually announced themselves, they did request a no knock warrant. Um, so the initial investigation, uh, as you probably are aware, was looking for DeMarcus uh, Glover and another individual. And DeMarcus Glover was alleged to be the ex-boyfriend of Breonna Taylor. So in order to get probable cause to um, search Breonna Taylor's um, home, they had to connect her somehow to DeMarcus, um, I think it's Jamarcus, I'm sorry, Jamarcus, um, Glover. They had to connect her or her home somehow to him. And so um, Detective James, uh, uh, what he did was he said, I have received credible information from a postal inspector that uh, Jamarcus Glover is receiving evidence here. Okay, so that establishes the probable cause because he's alleging that there's drugs being funneled through the mail system by Jamarcus Glover. Well, it turned out that that actually was not true, but that that's what established the probable cause for the warrant. Now we have to look at the language that was used to get the no-knock portion of the warrant. Remember, I told you that they have to have reasonable suspicion of either it's dangerous or they're going to destroy drugs. And so this is the actual language that they use, that the, um, due to the nature of how drug traffickers operate, these drug traffickers have a history of attempting to destroy evidence and can, they have cameras located. So this information here was actually copied from the DeMarcus Glo Jamarcus Glover um, search warrant and actually didn't apply at all to either Kenneth Walker or Breonna Taylor. So not only did they not really have probable cause to search her house to get the warrant, they also did not have a valid allegation for reasonable suspicion um, for the basis for the no-knock warrant itself. Now, what are problems with no-knock warrants? Of course, they're, you know, danger to police officers, right? Police officers die, innocent people die because no-knock warrants are, are issued. We have no idea who's coming in, into our home and therefore we shoot first. And then that ends up with police officers being injured and uh, innocent people being, being injured as well. Another problem with no-knock warrants is it kind of runs afoul of our castle doctrine and our doctrines related to self-defense, right? A man's home is their castle. That's where we get to retreat or stay inside and protect. And we don't have to retreat if we are in imminent danger, even if we can retreat in safety, we don't have to. We can sit there and we can, we can defend ourselves. But in Louisville, if police officers have lawful authority, or in Kentucky, I think it's Kentucky, in Kentucky, if police officer has lawful authority and they announce, that's the other part of that, if they announce, then the Castle Doctrine wouldn't trump your right to self-defense. That's the law in, in Kentucky. Oops, sorry, pushing it wrong. So what are some solutions? Well, we could ban no-knock warrants. Um, there are still over 30 states that the yellow, if you see the yellow, the yellow is where no-knock warrants are regularly allowed. Um, the blue is where they're allowed in extenuating circumstances. And then as you can see, there's only one state at the time of this map. I think there's two states now, if I'm not mistaken, um, that actually ban them. Um, I know that Louisville um, introduced Brianna's law, and I know that um, legislation has been introduced to try to make it a statewide law. Senator Rand has also um, authored a bill for justice for Brianna Taylor Act, in which he is um, banning it uh, for federal, but also for states nationwide that accept um, funding from the Justice Department. We could get independent warrant review boards, right? We could at least require perhaps more than one judge to find probable cause in a warrant. Now that might take up some time, but the time is worth the life. We could get transparent procedures for execution of search warrants. Now, 
I say that because I could not find nowhere what the execution rules were for Kentucky. I even called state police, two towns. I even called the state troopers. Nobody could tell me what the rules were, meaning when, when can I execute this warrant? What is the time of day? Is there a length of time the warrants are open? I think we have to clearly define what it means to knock and announce. Um, if the whole point of knocking and announcing is so that I, I, the homeowner, can hear you enter and therefore protect myself as well, well as um, comply with your command, then there has to be some meaningful way that I understand that. To this day, I think, uh, I think the case is US versus bank, if I'm not mistaken. And I think the, the longest that police officers have to wait and be refused is 15, I think 15 to 20 seconds. That is not a very long time um, for someone to get to the door and respond. We might also require body cameras when executing after dusk um, at nighttime to show exactly what happened. Um, those might be helpful, at least in the investigation. It might not prevent um, it might not prevent deaths, but at least we'll know how the investigation should run. And then, do not allow qualified immunity when these violations occur. Um, so now I'm going to switch over, and I'm almost finished. I don't know if I'm over my time. Actually, Professor Baldwin, is it is it possible for us to uh, to address some of the BLM issues in the Q and A? Sure. Is Absolutely. that all right? I just I, want to make sure that we have enough time for sort of a robust discussion. No worries. Thank you so much. Professor Martin, you're muted. Thank you. Thank you so much, <laughs> Mr. Robinson. Um, I wanted to turn things over to Professor Corbett, but before I do, I wanted to remind our listeners, our viewers, that if you do have any questions, please feel free to text Isaiah Robinson, if you could wave Mr. Robinson, or Natalia Watkins, just text, put them in on the chat privately, and they will convey your questions to me, um, and we'll use that as the forum for having our discussion. Thank you so much, Professor Corbett, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, first, I wanna thank everybody for attending and I, I'm really, really happy about being given the opportunity to participate. Honored to be a part of the conversation. Uh, my job tonight is to talk to you a little bit about the concept of qualified immunity. So I hope I'm able to present it in a way that's digestible for everybody. I will forewarn you that I am technologically ungifted. I'm probably one of the few people in the world that has an iPhone three or four or whatever it is. So you're kind of stuck with looking at me because I don't have any ability to show you anything sexy. So I hope I don't bore you to death just by talking to you. But uh, as you know, our, our civil system of justice allows individuals to sue for monetary damages to compensate injured parties and hold people legally accountable for their actions. And the concept of qualified immunity provides legal protection for law enforcement officials who are sued in civil court. And that basically, if proven, uh, precludes them from being held liable for damages. And this is true whether the lawsuit occurs in federal court or in state court. So uh, I think if a police officer, for instance, is sued in federal court under what you'll learn is a 1983 claim by my colleague to follow, uh, the Supreme Court has said that the officer can really only be liable if there's a clear violation of an established law or right that every reasonable officer ought to know exists. And the right has to be established beyond a reasonable doubt. It's a very, very high threshold. So if you're a victim, you have to pretty much prove that there was some earlier court decision that said the same conduct under the same circumstances was either illegal or unconstitutional. As I said, a very, a very high threshold for people trying to defeat that particular doctrine. It operates similarly in state court. It's not an FBI officer, but usually it's a local law enforcement officer who's been charged with violating rights that are grounded in either state law, like a tort law or some other violation of rights under the state constitution. It might fluctuate a little bit from state to state, but generally speaking, uh, <clears throat> I know this is true in my state, it's also true in West Virginia, and I believe it's also true in Kentucky, that if you're a public official and you're accused of negligence, then any actions that are taken in the scope of your employment or in your scope of your duties 
that are largely discretionary in nature are going to be immune from lawsuits. Now, there are some uh, exceptions to that particular rule. If there's malicious conduct or willful or wanton behavior, et cetera, it's a different form of qualified immunity than is recognized in federal court, but it's the same basic result. So there's no liability in civil court if you've inflicted injury upon someone as long as you qualify for this uh, qualified immunity doctrine. So courts applying the doctrine, folks have given a lot of latitude to law enforcement officers uh, for lots of reasons. And a lot of those cases look a lot like the Taylor case where the allegation is that the officers used excessive force in the scope of their duties or injuries in the execution of, of the no-knock warrant that Professor Baldwin described. Uh, so the question is arisen, well, why do we have this doctrine? And there's obviously uh, two different sides of the street here. People argue that police officers need latitude to do their jobs. Uh, there are a bunch of judgment calls over the course of their day-to-day. -day. The jobs are very fluid. Uh, they can go from zero to 60 in terms of danger to person and to community really, really quickly. So courts have been a little reluctant to interfere with the flexibility that police officers need in order to be effective in their jobs. And you know, there's also, there's always the argument of it would open Pandora's box and invite way too many lawsuits. So those are just some of the reasons that there's support for this particular doctrine. But there's also a, an opposite, opposite side of the street that says that you know, when you have it, there can literally be no accountability for police officers and no justice for victims when law enforcement uh, officers act beyond the scope of what their authority may be. So when you have this lack of accountability in the field, it, it kind of opens the door to over-policing uh, in some communities and aggressive policing tactics that can, can lead to harm. Uh, as was just you know, eloquently described uh, by Professor Baldwin, we know that, that Ms. Taylor and her boyfriend were awakened in the middle of the night so officers could execute a search warrant. And that obviously seems rife with potential danger for, for any number of reasons. And it's always been interesting to me that if the police wanna wiretap my phone, they need a heightened particularized reason beyond what regularly qualifies as probable cause in order to do that. But interestingly, we don't have similar, similarly special rules for breaking into people's houses in the middle of the night. So when those tactics are disproportionately used, against people of color, then it decreases the trust between law enforcement and surrounding communities. And it also has the impact of penalizing good officers as well as bad officers because it paints them all uh, with the same brush. So obviously, you know, that's kind of an oversimplification of, of how the doctrines work, but I hope it gives you a flavor for it. And, and the question in light of what we've seen thus far is does it have to stay this way? You know, does it, does it always have to be uh, uh, does, does the law have to operate in this particular way? Well, this is judgment law. So it's judicial precedent and the legislatures, be they state or federal, uh, could determine that we want to abolish qualified immunity. Colorado, the state of Colorado did that in June, passed a law that banned chokeholds and the use of deadly force for, for nonviolent offenses. And they also became the first state to legislatively ban qualified immunity as a defense to uh, state constitutional claims. So they don't end it uh, they did not end the doctrine entirely. It still applies in some context, but when it comes to state constitutional claims in which a lot of these circumstances and fact patterns arise, uh, this is a major step in the fact that they're the first to do it. Uh, on the federal level, uh, Congress has a couple of bills out there. They have uh, and what's called the End Qualified Immunity Act, which would eliminate qualified immunity for all state and local government officers. Uh, there's another bill, and I, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, I don't remember the sponsors of these bills, but uh, the other bill, I believe, is called the Justice and Policing Act, which would remove qualified immunity for law enforcement officials. Uh, but we know how difficult it is uh, to get anything done on the federal level because of the partisanship and the gridlock that's involved there. So it may be up to individual states to make it happen. Uh, we've also seen some local legislative movement pertaining to the Taylor case. Back in May, uh, the city of Louisville banned police officers from using no-knock warrants. Uh, as, as was mentioned earlier, they, they became popular in the War on Drugs Institute way back in the 80s, and there's good reason for them, but as mentioned, they can be dangerous, especially if they're executed in the middle of the night. So, you know, as we, we know that there's a dispute 
with regard to the facts in terms of whether the officers really did knock and announce. There was one witness, I believe, at the grand jury investigator at the grand jury thought process that said they did hear it, but there were other folk in the area that said they did not hear it. So uh, that kind of is where we are, at least right now. Uh, as was mentioned, I think two states now have already banned no knock warrants. I want to say Florida and Oregon, but I can be off about that. So we are seeing some changes that can be good and can be positive steps. Uh, and, and moving us in a different direction. Now, the other kind of side issue that it's forged is, is kind of a new debate about what's about an old issue called prosecutorial discretion. And it's one of the sub issues that, that lingers near the surface in cases like these, because before we ever get to the question of qualified immunity, there sometimes can be a, a different question involving prosecutorial discretion. And what I mean by that is basically pro prosecutors have a ton of autonomy when it comes to several critical phases, not of the civil process, but of the criminal process. Uh, as an example, you know, prosecutors have the ability to decide what to charge the defendant with. And uh, that almost uh, will predetermine the kind of sentence a defendant receives if he's deemed to be guilty, particularly in federal court cases. Then there's also the plea bargaining process. A lot of your criminal cases end in guilty pleas. The judge has to approve whatever deal emerges from the plea bargaining process, but they rarely push back when they get it because it often means that you're avoiding the time and the expense of a trial. So that is often totally within the realm of the prosecutor. You can't plead guilty to a lesser offense unless the prosecutor offers that as an option for you. And then you have uh, sentencing recommendations, again, which are going to come strictly from the prosecutor and, again, can, uh, can hold the defendant's fate uh, in his or her hands, almost exclusively, these are largely private conversations that do not happen in a public space. Now, people tell you that, that you need this for a number of reasons, uh, obviously for judicial economy reasons and efficiency reasons, you wanna speed up a process that's often backlogged. Uh, you know, a lot of courts have upheld these kind of challenges to prosecutorial decisions because they don't wanna undermine the authority of judicial officers by second guessing them. Uh, so it's very difficult to challenge in court. And, and in fairness, you really do need uh, district attorneys and U.S. attorneys to have the latitude to make some of these calls. But, but I think as emerged after the, uh, the, the announcements by the Attorney General in the Taylor case, it can create all kinds of complications, like I said, at many stages and, and was already articulated wonderfully. The, the grand jury proceedings is one of those stages. It's, it was secret in the Taylor case, as it always is. And it's very true that the grand jury typically has to approve indictments before you can go ahead with, with fairly serious criminal cases. But it's also true that the prosecutors have tremendous influence over that process. And most of the time, grand jurors are just going to approve whatever prosecutors ask them for in terms of charges. So there was you know, very, very little doubt in my mind that, that the attorney general could have released a transcript at the beginning uh, of the process with the approval of the court. Because without the totality of that, it makes it hard for the family to be confident uh, in the system if all they see is what the prosecutors determined to make public. So thankfully, because of the efforts of uh, grand jury members one and two, that may not be an issue uh, going forward. But when you have this kind of discretion, it can intentionally or unintentionally exacerbate the problems of racial inequity that exist in our criminal justice system, both in terms of how criminal defendants are treated and how victims of crime are seen. And, and again, the Taylor prosecution and grand jury proceedings provided us a really good example of that. So, you know, these are all areas that are that are, are difficult to manage for obvious reasons. Uh, we did have a federal case out of the Fourth Circuit fairly recently, where even though the courts have been reticent to find liability in many instances, in this Fourth Circuit case, and again, I'm sorry, I don't remember the case off the top of my head in terms of its name, but there was a, an African-American man and named Wayne Jones. He was stopped, I want to say in West Virginia, for not walking on the sidewalk. Uh, he was homeless. He was schizophrenic. He was asked by the officer why he wasn't on the sidewalk. An argument ensued. And then as often happens, one thing leads to about seven. And eventually there are five officers on the scene. They taser him several times and he was placed in a chokehold. He was subdued. One of the officers saw him uh, that he had a knife and the officer stepped back over fire and they shot him 22 times and he died right there on the sidewalk. So the family sued. And they finally got to the Fourth Circuit, and the court said that qualified immunity was not applicable, and specifically cited the death of George Floyd in finding that it should not be used as a shield 
uh, when the excessive force is unwarranted. So that case will get to go forward. So it's an uphill battle, obviously, in the big picture, but still having precedent on the books like that is helpful for future petitioners. Now, just so you know, in case you didn't know, uh, the Taylor family did file a civil suit against the city of Louisville, uh, and that suit was settled out of court for $12 million. Uh, in addition to the money, there were also uh, police reforms that were requested as a part of that settlement. But in the meantime, what happens is because of the way the systems operate, we're stuck with this really peculiar paradox where the city has paid $12 million to the family in a civil suit for behavior that our criminal justice system has said was completely lawful. So it's strange stuff, but, but then again, this is 2020 and it's the time of the strange, evidently. So, so uh, there's more I'll say. I will, I will stand down for now and turn it over to uh, my colleague and then uh, happy to answer questions to the degree that I can. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Corbett. We really appreciate the um, perspective, particularly on Section 1983 and prosecutorial discretion, which I'm sure we'll explore in the QA. Um, Q&A. And now, last but of course not least, we have Professor Robert Bastris, who will be talking to us now. Take the floor, Professor Bastris. Okay, thank you, Jenna. Uh, and it's a pleasure for me to participate in this panel as well, and, and an honor, um, echoing what the, the uh, other panelists have said. Um, it really struck me when I was reviewing the, the facts of this case. Um, if you focus in on the moment at which the police opened the two officers in the uh, in the apartment, um, there was another officer outside, and he's the one who's been charged with uh, uh, endangerment, uh, reckless endangerment. But the two officers in 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 the apartment, uh, if if you look at it, the incident from their perspective, which you have to do under current law, the current law says you you determine whether police have used excessive force by looking at the reasonableness of their actions uh, from the perspective at the time that the incident occurred uh, and not in hindsight. So uh, their perspective is it would be everything. And so the police entered the apartment uh, and the first thing they encounter is a gunshot and which actually hits one of them. And so they respond with fire which perhaps under the circumstances, um, one could easily see that that's a, a reasonable response to being shot is to fire back. Whether they needed dozens of bullets, I couldn't venture, but uh, in any event, at least the initial response seems, uh, if not warranted, at least uh, not unreasonable. Um, and, and, uh, and, and of course, as I said, that is the focus in uh, litigation, um, whether it's civil or criminal, or over whether there was excessive force. But when you look at the broader evidence in the case, uh, referring to the wider net of police activity, um, you, you, you come away with a different perspective and, and real questions about what the police did that day um, and night. The, uh, the police did have a warrant, as others have mentioned, um, but the warrant was obtained in the middle of the day, at least 12 hours before the warrant was executed. So, uh, but the police wait until 1240 in the morning to serve it. And I, to me, that reflects a, a somewhat um, callous uh, perception about people's um, lives and rights. Um, and, and the police went there with the thought, with their knowledge at the time was that there was just one woman uh, in the apartment. They only knew of Breonna Taylor's uh, residency there. Uh, they did not know she was with her boyfriend, a guy named Walker. Um, so there was even less reason to think, for them to think, that they needed to bust down a door and 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 barge in, um, so they get there and whether they knocked and for how long is um, a disputed fact, as I understand it. Whether they announced themselves is also in dispute, although the weight of the witnesses recounting uh, is that they didn't, but um, the police I think said that they did. 
uh, in any event, uh, Walker and presumably uh, Briona did not hear them. All that they heard was a somebody ramming on their front door at 1240 in the morning. Um, and of course, their reaction was natural. Um, they were scared. Um, so they jump out of bed when they hear this. And, uh, uh, and, and I forgot to mention, too, the police come barging in wearing plain clothes. Um, so there's no reason when, when Walker and Briona see the police for them to think that these are cops. Um, and of course, that would have made a serious difference in whether Walker would have used his gun or not, because who's going to open up on cops in a small space like an apartment? I mean, that's a suicide. Um, so, so they're in bed, uh, not surprisingly, at 4, 4, uh, 12, 4 in the morning and asleep. Um, and, and then they're aroused from their slumber by this loud banging, not banging, uh, ramming of their front door. Um, and so they go out and they're greeted by these, this pair of plain clothes, op, plain, uh, plain clothes officers. So the, the point of this rundown of the facts is that the course of police conduct in this case, essentially, in, in my opinion, created a dangerous situation. It was asking for some kind of, um, uh, some kind of reaction, which would not have been a thoughtful and reasoned uh, reaction. It was creating a dangerous situation which forced people to act under stress and a great deal of, of fear. And that's precisely what happened on both sides. Um, as, as I understand the facts, at least. Walker, it seems to me, acted reasonably. And, and if somebody gets shot, firing back with their weapon is not, at least not unreasonable. So, um, it, it, it seems to me um, there needs to be some accountability here and the current system needs some reform to provide it. It might have to be a statutory reform. I suspect it will, but I, I think the, the, the situation is ripe for reform. And uh, thanks to a very thoughtful memo by Dean Taylor that he wrote for his Crim Pro class and then was kind enough to share with me I must say it's, it was the rare case in which I read all of a John Taylor memo. Um, so um, that's sort of an inside joke, but um, the memo uh, tells me that um, people are starting to talk about this. Um, they're starting to call for uh, specific procedures for police to um, uh, pr follow. And when they're not followed, um, there should be uh, accountability in the form of probably of civil liability and certainly uh, perhaps uh, discipline. Um, and, and so looking at that, um, if, if you look at the course of conduct, rather than just focusing on that one little minute when the cops were reasonably felt threatened for their lives, and you look at the broader course of conduct as to whether um, um, how the search warrant was executed, and of course, whether they got a search warrant at all in the first place, uh, an examination of whether there were any mitigating measures taken either before or after the incident was created. Um, and, and I think there are have been discussions about creating such causes of action and the Supreme Court in 2017 took a baby step towards that end by at least recognizing that an officer could be liable if it's shown that his failure to get a warrant was a probable cause of what ended up being two very seriously injured people. Um, and, and of course, I think the um, process of civilian input and oversight of police departments, uh, I think can be valuable. That's been resisted mightily by police. We've been trying to establish some measure of that in West Virginia for 30 years. And um, it's just gotten nowhere. There's been legislation uh, repeatedly introduced to, um, to address it. And um, it's being debated currently in Morgantown. Um, 
and also being resisted as well. Uh, but there are there is a citizen group working on that. Um, and, and then, of course, the other side of accountability is um, civil liability. And uh, Professor Corbett has already described the difficulties of that uh, because of the um, qualified immunity doctrine, how difficult it is to get around it. And also because that doctrine creates the opportunity for both judges and juries to give cops an out, even when um, there seems to be responsibility for an incident, not necessarily that their immediate reaction to a dangerous situation was unreasonable, but they created, they helped to create that dangerous situation. Um, and I want to quote briefly from um, the case that uh, Professor Corbett referred to, which by the way was the Jones versus City of Martinsburg. Um, it, it's a very powerful and poignant decision. And uh, it was written by, appropriately enough, I guess, Judge Floyd, um, shortly after the George Floyd incident, uh, when the, is when the opinion came out. And of course, Judge Floyd is an African American on the Fourth Circuit, uh, an excellent judge, but uh, th he really sets it out there as to what the current situation is. And, and uh, Professor Corbett ac accurately described the facts. I mean, this guy was just strolling and he ends up being um, um, armed only with a knife. He was uh, tased four times, hit in the brachial plexus, kicked and placed in a chokehold um, which the, uh, there was a video of the, of the whole thing and they, it, it, you could hear him gagging on it. So he was obviously having difficulty breathing. Um, and the, uh, district judge had found that it was not clearly established that that, oh, and then uh, he, while he was down and I don't know if he was unconscious, that wasn't clear, but he wasn't moving. He was totally, um, motionless. He was on his back. He was pinned against a wall and there were five police officers standing around him. And um, when they saw the knife, they ended up shooting him 22 times uh, in the back mostly and in the buttocks. Um, so this is, uh, and, and after the district court found that that was not clearly established illegal conduct, um, Judge uh, Floyd concluded his, his uh, case with this uh, narrative. Um, Wayne Jones was killed just over one year before the Ferguson, Missouri shooting of Michael Brown, when, when it would once again draw national scrutiny to police shootings of black people in the United States. Seven years later, we asked to decide whether it was clearly established that five officers could not shoot a man 22 times as he lay motionless on the ground. Although we recognize that our police officers are often asked to make split second decisions, we expect them to do so with respect for the dignity and worth of black lives. Before the ink dried on this opinion, the, the FBI opened an investigation into yet another death of a black man at the hands of police, this time George Floyd in Minneapolis. This has to stop. To award qualified immunity at the summary judgment stage in this case would signal absolute immunity for fear-based use of deadly force, which we cannot accept. The district court's grant of summary judgment on qualified immunity is reversed uh, and the dismissal of that claim, um, uh, the dismissal of that defense is reversed. Um, Professor Bastra? Yeah. Do you mind if I stop you there? We want to make sure that we have enough times and that seems like an appropriate. Let me give you two two real quick footnotes. Um, one is that there are calls for changes. Uh, Justice Thomas has several times uh, descended from denials of cert uh, on calling for uh, re-examination of qualified immunity. And I did want to let people know that the law in West Virginia is on qualified immunity is that you can establish it by the objective test of a clear violation or by showing that the conduct was uh, malicious or um, 
oppressive. So there is an alternative means which is not objective, uh, which goes to the subjective um, mindset of the offending officer. Thank you, Jen. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. It's just we we I already have six questions in the queue, and I want to make sure that we have a robust discussion. So thank you so much to our panelists for their presentations on both the criminal law, the constitutional law issue. I have lots of questions. Um, I'm going to exercise um, some restraint in having them, um, but I might also take advantage of moderator privilege and allow myself a couple of them um, just for my own knowledge. Um, so the way that we're gonna do this is we received questions both ahead of time um, and then during the presentations now. Um, and I, my plan is to go through the questions in the order in which they were received um, some of these, I think, especially the questions that came in beforehand were addressed um, to some extent during the presentations. So if there's anyone who wanted to sort of add a little footnote here and there to it, um, but we might be able to move through those fairly quickly. Others, I think, can provide a sort of more robust basis for discussion. Um, and actually the first question, I think <laughs> um, I might, I, I just said this, and now that I'm thinking about it, I might save the first question, the last one, because I think it's a really good way to sort of wrap up things and and um, and and put a put a nice little sort of way of thinking about that. It's from a law student who wanted to know sort of what they can do um, to sort of help encourage police reform and discourage systemic racism. And I think that would be a really good way to wrap up the conversation. So I'm I've acknowledged I wanted to acknowledge the question, but I'm going to put a pin in it till, till later. On the other side, we had another question that says. There is no doubt that Breonna Taylor's death was a terrible tragedy. My concern is that false facts about this case spread like wildfire, wildfire, excuse me, as did incorrect statements of the law, e.g. E referring to her death as a murder. How can we as lawyers combat the spread of misinformation in such a tumultuous social climate without, causing, without coming across as heartless? Um, so there's a couple of things in there that I think our panelists can unpack. If one of the four panelists wants to address that specifically, feel free to raise your, raise your hand or unmute yourself. Otherwise, um, I will use my professor privileges and call on people. So or is there one of our four panelists that wanted to, wanted to address it? All right, if not, then I'm going to call on P Professor Baldwin. Can you talk a little bit about this idea of how we can deal with the legal standard um, according to this? I'm assuming it's a law student who wrote the tale. I, I actually don't have access to who talked about it, but is there any sort of advice that you have about how we can talk about this context with murder versus killings and the facts? Uh, sure. Um, I also want to take the time to, to just thank everybody on the panel and to thank the audience and to thank Natalia and Balsa for inviting me and apologize for, you know, you give the mic to a professor who was a lawyer and you're bound to be here all night. Um, I think that um, to address that question, I don't think that it is our role to correct that. I don't, I don't think it's our role to correct that. Society doesn't have an understanding of, of legally, so to speak, a homicide. I mean, you know, and that would be probably, you know, whether or not it's a homicide or not, right? I don't think that's our role. I think it's our role to be responsive to um, what the law requires. I think it's, it's our role to educate, um, but I'm not sure that I think it's our role to make a proactive um, advocacy towards the law when we clearly have, and in this particular case, when we clearly have a, a victim, we do. Um, by any standard, Breonna Taylor is a victim. And so to try, uh, try to correct maybe political words like murder and things like that, I just don't feel that that's, that's our role. I don't feel it's useful. I feel educating society perhaps on um, maybe definitions and, and why maybe the grand jury decided this way or things like that. I think that's our role, um, but taking the proactive, if that's what you ask, um, I, I don't think that's, that's our role. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Corbett, Bastras, um, Seifert, is there anything that you wanted to add to that? Or if not, we'll move on to the next question. If you do, just feel free to unmute, otherwise. Professor Corbett? 
Uh, she handled it perfectly. There's nothing I could add. So I'm, I'm unmuting to say there's nothing I can add. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, okay. In, in terms of what law students can do, I mean, it's like any other issue. You can engage in the edu others in the educational process and try to um, work through the usual political channels. Like I mentioned earlier, the group forming, trying to form a police, uh, civilian police oversight committee commission. Uh, that's the work of people just lobbying for it. Um, and I mean, that's the kind of stuff which is always available, I think, to, to law students or anyone else. <laughs> Just as a sort of asterisk to what Professor Bass just said, I am actually a member of the Morgantown Human Rights Commission Committee, which is one of the groups that was involved in the Police Reform Act. So to the extent that anyone wants to get involved, I'm gonna use this as my opportunity to plug, um, feel free to email me um, with regard to that because there, there has definitely been, as Professor Bass just said, some controversy over that in Morgantown. Okay, so the next question we have has a sort of long, long historical windup, but I think it's worth saying. So again, I'm going to repeat the question verbatim, and it goes like this. Some of the origins of policing in America can be traced back to early 19th century with the creation of slave patrols. One specific example is the Charleston City Watch and Guard formed in the 1790s, which was created by the white minority to closely monitor the majority enslaved people and be ready to take control should an uprising start. Later, after Reconstruction, groups were created to uphold racialized black codes, and by the 1890s, every major city had a police force. Today, there are many instances where police narratives do not align with reality. For example, the police incident report from the shooting of Breonna Taylor listed her injuries as, quote, none, quote, and stated there was no forced entry into her home. Unfortunately, police are given an elevated status in criminal trials as their evidence often serves as the foundation for criminal convictions and their reputation for truth telling is considered untouchable. So the question is, or there are two parts, is it wise for the judicial system to continue to rely on the police as a central method of operation for the judicial system? And two, given the racist roots and unstable nature of our policing system, what alternatives can we imagine to divest from the police in carrying out the functional roles of the judicial system, such as serving subpoenas and providing courtroom security? Okay, <laughs> I'm happy to repeat any of that if that was too much of a mouthful. Um, but Professor Corbett, is there, do you wanna take that on? You know, I, the contract didn't say I was going to be called on. So <laughs> not, I don't know how, how pleased I am about this. But, okay, so it, it's 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 a huge question. It's a lot to process, and so I so my struggle is not in not wanting to participate. It's just I don't know where to start exactly. Uh, and I think some of what I'll say, and I hope that some of this is responsive to what the question is, is I think the first before we could do any of those things, we have to kind of sort of be on the same page that what we're seeing is a problem. And I'm not sure that that everyone thinks it's a problem, okay? I know that when I see these things occur, I think it's a problem in our society and one that needs to be addressed. However, I know people, and I'm sure people in the audience know people as well, who look at what happened with, with George Floyd and, and, and countless other incidents, and they say to themselves, well, that's really my tax dollars doing what they're supposed to do. Law enforcement is supposed to protect me from certain individuals. And therefore, if we lose one or two in the process of that protection, so be it. And, and while that may be a somewhat cynical approach, I don't think it's necessarily inaccurate. Now, I hope that there's more people like me than there are of the other side of the fence. But, but I think that before you can come to an understanding about what we can do to reform the system, I think you have to have at least more of a consensus that the system needs to be reformed. And I think that as long as you have that, that conflict there, then I think it's gonna be problematic to institute the kind of changes that, that the question references. I, I feel like I'm rambling, I hope that made sense. No, that makes perfect sense. Um, okay. Do any of our panelists wanna add anything to that? If so, feel free to unmute yourself. If not, then we'll move on to the next question. Oh, Professor Baldwin is going to unmute herself. So I saw, I saw the hand, Professor Baldwin. 
So I was trying them. You remember I'm working on right, right. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> so I, I think I, I agree with Professor Corbett. I think it also um, you also have to realize or figure out: Am I a reformist or am I an abolitionist? Right. And if you, um, I'm sorry. And, you know, most abolitionists would argue that because of the racialized connection um, between um, policing and its history, we can't really imagine a system beyond that. And because we can't imagine a system beyond that, it's hard for us to offer viable solutions that would be acceptable or even heard um, when it comes to understanding what defund the police actually means. Um, are we trying, you know, of course we can't live in a system where there's no mechanism of control, right? There would be chaos. Um, but in, in using that terminology until we, we get to the understanding, are we really reformists or are we abolitionists? I think that's going to be the hard hard uh, place to drive us together to come to viable solutions. But we know that the current system that's built on racism cannot continue because it's built on racism. Right. Thank and, you. and if I could, now you can't give me to be quiet. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, I told you, you, you give a lawyer a <laughs> mic. No, I, but, but what I was going to add to that is this is where the, the, inability to agree on certain facts about what's going on is also extremely problematic because now we're in a space where there's not just partisanship, but hyper-partisanship. And, and we ought to be able as people just to be able to agree on certain things that human beings ought to be able to agree on, right? So if someone gets shot seven times in front of their child, that should be something we all agree is terrible, right? But in doing, in, in agreeing with that, it might mean forfeiting a piece of my argument that the other side might make. So I can't agree with that. I have to find some reason as to why the police acted this way. Well, he was, he was already up on charges. He had a knife, he had all kinds of things. And we end up losing our humanity there in some ways. And I think as long as you have that problem where we can't agree on basic facts in terms of what our human response is going to be to those basic facts, it makes it so much more difficult to, to create the kind of solutions that Professor Baldwin spoke to. Oh, it makes sense. Um, okay, so I actually want to use my, again, my moderator privileges to ask a question of my own um, and to highlight my 1L criminal law knowledge um, that I remember from however many decades ago, which is this. Um, Professor Baldwin, I think it was either during your presentation or Professor Seifert's, I don't remember. Um, you talked about sort of prosecutorial discretion. No, it was Professor Seifert. So the, so the role of prosecutorial discretion. And immediately what came to mind was the Batson case and the Batson doctrine, right? Which says, while normally prosecutors have a lot of discretion within the idea of peremptory challenges, um, you are not allowed to use sort of racial discrimination. And again, this is decades old knowledge that I'm pulling from. So if I'm getting this wrong, tell me. But you are not allowed to use racial prejudice, racial discrimination within the context of peremptory peremptory challenges. Did I get the basic facts on that right? The con law symbol? Yeah. Okay, so then my question is, have there been any calls, because you mentioned in your solutions, Professor Baldwin, um, sort of different ways, have there been any calls to sort of basically amend Batson to this context, right? So that um, a prosecutor cannot use um, his prosecutorial discretion within the context of grand jury hearings um, specifically if there's evidence of racial animus or racial prejudice. And I, and I actually, I don't know if that was present, present here in the Breonna Taylor case, but it, it called it to mind. Um, and again, I, I, I figured I'd pick on you first, Professor Baldwin, but then we open it up to Professor Baskin. I think it's a Professor Seifert question, even though it did infuse race, it really speaks to her talking about how grand jurors um, are selected. So I will defer to her first okay. and then, you know, pick up on the racial aspect if, if needed. Yeah, that'd be great. What do you think, Professor Seifert? So I think, I think, sorry, um, I think first of all that, you know, Batson speaks about, of course, as you said, peremptory challenges. So when I was talking about prosecutorial discretion, I was talking less about the discretion to select jurors, which is somewhat constrained, and more about broad discretion in the way that Professor Corbett talked about it. I tell students 
in classes that I teach that I think prosecutors are the most powerful people in our criminal justice system, not judges, prosecutors, because the ability to bring charges forward, even through a grand jury process, given the high likelihood of indictment, and then given the high likelihood that you will plead out if you are criminally charged, means that prosecutors are really the gatekeepers to the criminal justice system in ways that are really staggering. And we, so when we think about trying to constrain prosecutorial discretion, I think less about Batson style things and more about the ethics of how it is we select prosecutors, the ways that we train them, the ways that we think about safeguarding the grand jury process and other things. And for what it's worth, I sometimes have students and I just yesterday in office hours had students saying to me, you know, I'm interested in criminal law, but I'm really committed to social justice. So I don't wanna go anywhere near being a prosecutor. And I'm like, whoa, that's a problem. If all the people committed to social justice don't wanna be prosecutors, that's a massive problem. We need really wonderful prosecutors with high levels of integrity and ethics who are committed to seeing these issues through and are committed to doing a great job and being um, you know, voices of change within the system, working for change within the system. Perfect, thank you. Professor Baldwin, did you wanna to add to that? No, I, I think, I think she, she did great. I think, um, I, you know, we always say no and then we continue to talk, right? So I'm not gonna do it, I'm just gonna say no and I'll let you go to the next question. Okay, fair enough. Um, uh, and I, and actually I'm gonna pick on Professor Seifert again because um, this seems to be more relevant to her presentation and it is this. Question is, was the reason given by the Commonwealth's attorney, Tom Wine, for his recusal was that he was conflicted because he was prosecuting Taylor's boyfriend for shooting at police, unusual or suspicious? It, it is not like he was representing the police in that case, right? Um, and then as part of it, are prosecutors normally unable to try separate cases against defendants who may have shot each other? Okay, so I think that I will actually put on my professional responsibility hat to answer this question, less so than my criminal law hat. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to sort of speculate on his motives, though I will say it, it was May 13th, I believe, that he um, recused himself and uh, A.G. Cameron took over. And it was just a few weeks later that they actually dismissed the charges against Kenneth Walker. So yes, the reason he gave for recusal was that he was going to be prosecuting Kenneth Walker. And then a few weeks after recusing himself, he dismissed the charges against Kenneth Walker. Now, I believe that his stated rationale there was there was an FBI investigation and it would be inappropriate to have the criminal case going uh, at the same time as the FBI investigation, though that has not stopped or slowed down the Hankinson case. So take, take that for what you will. But there are, of course, uh, reasons that a prosecutor's office has to be careful about conflicts. And if you are prosecuting one defendant, and I believe that Mr. Walker had been charged with attempted murder, and if you are prosecuting a defendant for attempted murder, and then at the same time, you're going to be potentially prosecuting officers for having created the danger that resulted in the attempted murder, there absolutely could be conflicts there that could be problematic. And so I think I don't really want to speculate on his motivation, but from a professional responsibility perspective, I'm not surprised that they deemed that there was a potential conflict that made recusal the best plan. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're gonna to go to the penultimate question because I also want to be mindful of everyone's time um, and knowing that we are, I've, the contract that Professor Corbett signed up for just had it, had it ending at 7.30, so I want to be mindful of that. So the second to last question is, when is qualified immuni immunity relevant? Do officials need the flexibility qualified immunity provides them when, when, our constitu when our constitutional rights are on the line? And I would throw that open to either you, Professor Bastris, or you, Professor Corbett. Um, I won't call on anyone specifically, but if you guys have ideas on that. It is the question, when is, when is, a so uh, when is qualified immunity relevant? Yes. Uh, it's relevant in any case where the defendant is a, an executive officer of government. Um, so obviously it comes up in all pol police misconduct cases, but it would also come up in other contexts such as um, um, uh, let me think. 
uh, enforcement of, a, of an ordinance, um, whether, whether it's by the police or not. Uh, it, it's, it is the immunity applicable to executive officers, unlike judicial officers or prosecutors or legislators who all own uh, absolute immunity. And do you feel, sir, that officials need the flexibility that qualified immunity provides them? And in, as in the question, when our constitutional rights are on the line? Well, I, I think the current doctrine is, I, I would not support the, the framing of the current um, immunity as it's only, um, violated when the right that's offended is clearly established because that's an one, it's a vague standard. Two, uh, it's awfully difficult to say what's clearly established, especially when you're dealing with in the federal government, uh, 14 different circuits. And then of course, um, when you're looking at 50 state jurisdictions as well, adding their two cents on a particular constitutional question, it's just, um, I mean, there are certainly some cases in which it's a no-brainer, but uh, by and large, it, it, it's awfully difficult to establish uh, a clearly established, <laughs> to, to prove that something's a clearly established right. Well, and that actually also answered the question I didn't think we would have time to get to, which was asking about clearly established. So I appreciate that. Professor Corbett, did you want to add anything? Well, no, I, I it was handled perfectly. I, I feel like, you know, it, it can't be, I don't want to say that it has no viability, but it can't be like absolute immunity with a lowercase a, which is essentially how it's applied now. The standard is allegedly different, but the as was referenced just a second ago, the, to, the standard to meet or to defeat qualified immunity is so high, it essentially works as absolute immunity when people get to court. So I think it just needs to be revisited and, and, um, and, and reconsidered and, and then maybe reframed. Uh, now, whether there is the enthusiasm or the willingness to do that, um, I'm not sure, but, but if it were up to me, that's what I would suggest. Fair enough. Okay, and so now for the final question, which I am going to address to, the, to the, all of the panelists and just ask you to sort of use this as a chance to answer and then also make concluding remarks if you think that is appropriate, which was the first question, which is this. What steps can we take as law students to help encourage police reform and discourage systemic racism and violence? Seems a good way to end the conversation. So, um, Professor Seifert, you want to go first? Ooh, um, it's a great question, um, and it's a it's a really important question, and I think certainly educating yourself attending panels like this. Um, BALSA did really great training two weeks ago on bystander training and focusing on trying to think about how best to be anti-racist in your work as a law student. That type of training, I think, is really important. I also think that you've hopefully learned tonight that a lot of things in this case are not necessarily about the law is in the, the, the criminal justice system. It's more about what the legislature can do and what the legislature doesn't do. And so voting is really important and thinking about who is your representative and whether or not they are doing what you want them to do. Again, I, I, I wanna put in a plug to not have students who are committed to social justice abandon jobs as prosecutors because I think that's really important. Um, and I think also, Honestly, I, I, I really would, would, oh, and I'm sorry, it was the bystander training was by APALSA, not BALSA. Dean Jernigan just sent me a note. I apologize for misspeaking there. Um, so I, I, I really think it's, it's also incredibly important, um, speaking as a white person, it's just really important to recognize that a lot of this is on us. We need to own who white supremacy benefits and we need to think about our role in dismantling and changing that system. And we need to be willing to feel really uncomfortable and, and, and place ourselves at risk and, and be brave and be bold. And at the same time, listen, listen to people of color, uh, to the guidance that they're giving us and take seriously their concerns. Thank you so much, Professor Seifert. 
Professor Baldwin, you want to go next? Yeah, I, I just going to echo a lot of stuff that Professor Cypher said. Um, I was going to bring up the NLG training, observer training. And I think that's the same thing as the bystander training by your APALSA um, club. Um, I think that you have to protest, that you, you actually have to get out there and protest. You have to vote, you have to educate, um, write your legislators. Um, if you are an ally, it, it, it's nice that you're against racism, but you need to be an anti-racist, and that means proactive um, in racism. You need to be able to explain, you know, white privilege. You need to be able to explain why blue lives matter is not the functional equivalent to black lives matter, right? Black lives matter about people. Blue lives is a job. I can quit that job. I can't quit being black. So you got to educate about what defunding means. You got to educate about what the issues are relating to, you know, qualified immunity and all of those things. Um, and I think I, I think that's probably what I have to add. Thank you. Perfect. I'm, I'm going across my screen. So Professor Bastos, you are next. Well, it's it's kind of echoing what uh, uh, Bridget and Amy has said, but you know, um, the Constitution provides a tool for people to influence others and influence policy. It's called the First Amendment. Uh, use it. And um, there are all kinds of ways in which it can be used in this context. We all have a platform in the form of uh, social media, for example, and the internet. Uh, it's the great thing. I don't use social media, but it's there for those who do. And, and obviously uh, we have access to pods and so forth. Uh, we can create them and we can um, participate in things like uh, Jenna is doing currently with the uh, Civilian Review and, and that commission. Um, and, you know, um, you have a right to instruct your representatives and under our state constitution and you can do that too. So, um, or um, you can marry a legislator. That's useful. <laughs> Not that you're speaking from personal experience or anything. <laughs> I'm just <in> handy. <laughs> Fair enough. Professor Corbett, you have the last word. Well, after you marry the legislature, what I would say <laughs> is just be, you know, continue to be conscientious about the world around you. I, I think, and, and continue to stay dedicated about educating yourself about what's happening. Because by and large, I think all of you know and understand that you know, having a law degree is a gatekeeper to lots of influential positions. And I think the more you understand about the world around you, uh, the better advisor you can be when you're asked for your advice and, and the, the better the odds are that you'll be able to create a more just world around you. So even though uh, I'm sure by the time you finish up, school is gonna be the last thing on your mind, just please remember that uh, you can continue to educate yourself without sitting in class each day. And I hope that you'll continue to do that even after uh, your uh, bar and get your license. Perfect. Thank you so much. Well, so this, again, I'm, I'm one of those professors that is actually quite mindful of time and we are over time, but we really appreciate everyone coming out and talking. I will say um, I had to cut off Professor Baldwin when she was in the middle of a really interesting presentation um, and she was just getting to the part where she was talking about sort of the intersection between uh, criminal law and Black, Live Ma Black Lives Matter. And I, for one, would really like to know more. And um, I understand that Professor Baldwin is willing to share. So for those of you who are interested, Professor Baldwin is going to spend a little time talking about the intersection between BLM and criminal law. For the rest of you who have dinners or I mean, what, I don't know what else happens in, in the pandemic world, but other commitments. Um, we want to just say thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for your incredible questions. And thank you so much for allowing us to engage in this dialogue. So um, have a good night for all of you who are not staying on. And thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to Professor Baldwin for those of you who are. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna. This particular time, I did not, it wasn't the lawyer requesting to continue talking. Uh, so let me see if I can pull my screen. Can I share my screen again? Is that okay? Um, Ms. Watkins has to make you a co-host. So okay. Ms. Watkins, can you do that? Um, give me one. Oh, there you are. You, yep, you're good now, Professor Baldwin. Okay.
Okay. Um, so um, I only have a couple more slides to give anyway. So I was just going to introduce to three women who uh, started the Black Lives Matter in 2013. Um, it was in response, of course, to the Trayvon Martin um, verdict, the acquittal um, of uh, George Zimmerman. But it actually got propelled when uh, Michael Brown was left, um, was killed in Ferguson. So this Alicia Garza, Opal Tometi, and Patrice Colliers. Um, Black Lives Matter um, calls for more of a radical and sustainable solution. Um, there, there, has, there has been, I think uh, one of, I can't remember who spoke about it, but a, a ban on chokeholds, um, but there has to be, has to be more. Um, if it wasn't for, um, if it wasn't for um, the blackness of a suspect becoming uh, the justification for a violent response by law enforcement, and violence and implicit bias, meaning those, uh, those unconscious attitudes and stereotypes that influences our decisions and influences what we do and how we produce responses. Um, that is why we have uh, a lot of the deaths occurring um, with um, people of color, particularly African-American males. I think there was a study done by the University of California, um, 2011, I want to say 2011 to 2014, and it concluded that there was a significant amount of implicit bias in policing. In fact, an unarmed black male as compared to an unarmed white male, I think was 3.5 times likely to be shot during these simulations. Um, police officers also were more willing to see an innocuous item like a cell phone as a gun and then shoot first and more than likely um, compared to armed white men in the simulation, they would shoot an unarmed black person before they shot an armed white person. Um, there's a higher level of implicit bias against black people. Um, and if it wasn't for social media's um, rapid dissemination of police violence against unarmed citizens, um, where we witness not only overcriminalization, we witness prosecution, arrest, we witness convictions, and then the deaths at the hands of police officers. Um, we have to, you know, we have to continue to fight. Um, because the justice system has failed our community and our community includes people of color. Um, the law has failed us. Um, the law failed Breonna Taylor and that would have been the end. Thank you so much, Professor Baldwin. Um, if anyone wants to stay on and send a, a little, um, send any more chats along that way, we can spend a couple more minutes talking about that. Um, but if not, um, I want to, again, thank everyone who stuck it out. Most of the people stuck it out, Professor Baldwin, so they very much wanted to hear sort of what you had to say on that. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, and as someone who is, uh, I, it's funny, I teach international human rights now, um, and we're dealing a lot with, as you might imagine, these issues within the international context. And it's, it's always been uh, an interesting and sort of interesting moment to talk about how this, the, the laws, how these issues affect people who look like me. So thank you so much for giving voice to that, Professor Baldwin. I appreciate that. Uh, and so seeing nothing else on the chat and seeing no other questions, I just wanna again, thank everyone for coming tonight and for having this conversation with us. I hope that we, this is the beginning of a conversation and that we have plenty of dialogues in a physically distanced way um, to encourage the, the, the stop of this pandemic. Um, and again, if anyone wants to contact me offline for the role with regard to the Morgantown Human Rights Commission, please feel free to do so. My name is Jenna Martin, um, and thank you everyone and good night. Thank you, Professor Baldwin. I see you're still on. Thank you so much.